Well, good morning, everybody. I wanted to start by looking at the last 72 hours of total accumulated snowfall. So this, of course, follows the multi-system uh, you know, setup we had for the last seven or eight days that delivered the blizzards in parts of the Midwest. It also delivered the very heavy snows throughout the Rocky Mountains and then set us up with the lake effect machine that's really going right now. This last system kind of was born on the nose of the colder air. So it kind of sunk through parts of the Rocky Mountains, really hitting parts of Colorado pretty hard yesterday. And you can see some of the snow that's just recently spread into parts of the mid-south and up toward the mid-Atlantic, mainly staying on the western side of the Blue Ridge and the uh, Appalachian Mountains. But this is going to press into New England today, and it's been a pretty tricky forecast for the snow in New England. I'll take a closer look at that in a few moments. But remember, to the south of this, we had ice as well, and so this has been a, a pretty rough go of it in this region in terms of travel, uh, just simply due to logistically trying to remove snow, because some of these snowfall totals were, were pretty high here, places jumping up over six inches of snow pretty easily. Now, to put this in broader context, let's just look at a ranks map, and this would just be January so far. So from the beginning of the year through the 15th, what are our precipitation ranks by climate district? And I want to highlight, we have a few areas that just remain out of the flow, and I'm concerned about how much longer this region is going to stay out of the flow as well. Some of the new forecast data suggest that we continue to keep the Canadian prairie into the northern plains of the United States, just separate from the better jet stream flow to return moisture into that area, which is going to possibly deepen the kind of the winter drought scenario in this in this pocket. But we're going to be talking a lot about snow that's in this area that's going to be melting. We're also going to talk about the flooding issues that are going to continue up the east coast as we press forward into this forecast. We get a bit of a break uh, that's coming soon after this next system kind of rolls through, but the problem is the longer term forecast just keeps the wetter conditions on. There will be more moisture coming into the west as well, but we still have this issue where a lot of it continues to target Northern California and, uh, and, and Oregon, Washington. So it comes in in this trajectory, leaving Southern California and Arizona largely out of the flow. We'll keep you up to date on that. But maybe one more way to look at it would be to kind of capture the percent of normal through the beginning of this new year. So wherever we see the reds, this is where we're, of course, in deficit. We kind of line out the southwest United States and also here in the northern plains. But a lot of places here are picking up not just double but triple their normal precipitation in some places even more than that. I want to give you another update on the river because this is just amazing to watch. The Mississippi River, excuse me, you know, it's now almost 14 feet above low stage. It's just amazing to think that five days ago it was uh, two feet below low stage. It's made all of that rapid, um, you know, uh, increase here basically on the rains that came through with the uh, two systems last week and then what we just got the other day. Now we're still dealing with quite a bit of cold air, but as you, we talked about yesterday, there's a transition that's about to happen that's gonna be moving this out by early next week, but we're gonna to have to deal with it for quite some time. And it's important to note how far into the south this is gonna make it, and also here into the Pacific Northwest. That's been an area we've been focusing on for the risk of ice. I'll come back to that in a few moments. But still, very dangerous temperatures moving across you know, this section here of North America. If you compare this globally and you compare it to average, okay, this is the coldest spot on the planet right now. Okay, so compared to their averages, it's the coldest spot uh, on the planet. So let's just take a look at some of the stats here. Since January 8th, this goes from the 8th to the 15th, we're just kind of trying to get kind of a bearing here on, on where these temperatures are placed historically. And um, in 132 years worth of data, going back to 1893, you know, this is a top five event, you know, in terms of this week, you know, compared to average for this week. This is one of the coldest uh, weeks in, in mid-early January uh, history for us that's right in through the spine here of the Rockies and coming down through the, through the plains. Uh, so with that all as a setup, I want to kind of give you some perspective on a couple of things that are changing. Now, this is a 10-day forecast. So I, I know I told you a moment ago that the coldest air on the planet is here, but this includes the next 10 days, which starts to show the mild air coming back into this region, meaning we're going to shift that same rhetoric right here to parts of Greenland, and that's going to be key. You see, when we start to develop a lot of cold air back into Greenland, what this does is it removes the, the potential for large ridges to build into the North Atlantic. And what happens instead is the jet stream kind of well, straightens out in this area. And that's actually going to be a key component to the overall flow that's moving across North America, setting us up for a big pattern change once we get into next week. Now, we like to observe that by looking at something called the North Atlantic Oscillation. I know a lot of my colleagues like to talk a lot about these teleconnections. Sometimes I just choose to describe them based on uh, the jet stream pattern. I'll just kind of point it out versus telling you about the teleconnection. 
connection or I'll you know, follow the trough ridge pattern. Either way is fine. There's nothing to be said about using indexes, but let's just talk about one right now. When the North Atlantic Oscillation in mid-December to early January took this big dive. That was the event that helped build big ridges into the North Atlantic. And that allows cold to get into the central United States, into the eastern United States. And that's what set us up with these storms. It was part of the recipe for that. You can see now we've started to build this back up and the forecasts are taking it back into positive territory. So what, what does all that mean? Well, if, if we're looking for big East Coast snow, big central U.S. snow and cold, it's best to have the NAO going negative. And right now it's going positive. So you can see where the cold begins to anchor now and the jet stream just rolls to the south of it. And we just want to know how long that's going to be because that will help determine kind of the, the, the flow of the atmosphere as it leaves the United States. And I'm about to show you what it's doing entering the United States. It's coming in something like this. Now, this is the current deep trough that is bringing in all that cold air and sending a system up the East Coast now, today. But behind it, you can see the jet stream starting to line itself out, becoming very zonal. And while this is going to continue to be an issue for the Western United States, whenever we get this kind of zonal flow getting closer and closer to the U.S., it starts to give a system more mild look overall yeah, in the pattern. So here we are. This is what we're still dealing with. We still have the deep trough of colder air in place, which is why there are wind chill advisories, watches, and warnings that get all the way down into the south here, and very, very cold conditions making it very far to the south, as you can see. Still have the winter storm warning that is out here, kind of in parts of Tennessee, Kentucky, up to West Virginia, Virginia, also right around the D.C. area, and then winter storm advi uh, winter weather advisories, excuse me, that stretch throughout parts of New England here. But on the back side of this, the west is, is going to be dealing with an ice storm here in the Willamette Valley. Still have the winter weather advisors, winter storm watches uh, for this next system that's going to roll through. But a lot of the country is going to get just a short break from these big winter storms. And by short, maybe seven or eight days where we go without seeing another big winter storm. But right now, there's a big one that's kind of brewing off the west coast. But it's, it's about how far into the U.S. it kind of penetrates that's key. So I want you to look at two things here on this animation. Your eye is probably drawn just to the big swirl that's out here in the open Pacific. So here's the west coast of the U.S. We're watching this. But I want you to see out ahead of this in the infrared imagery, the colors that are over here. Because when, you, when we look at infrared, what we're looking, we're measuring temperature. That's all we're doing. It's a brightness temperature that's measured by a, a, an instrument on satellite that's just designed to basically convert the radiance that hits the sensor into a temperature. It's looking way out there in the infrared. And so we can make a map that typically shows us some bright colors where things are very cold. Okay. And what I want you to notice is we've got ground. This is all ground here that is as cold as some of the cloud tops elsewhere. That's how arctic this air is. And what I'm concerned about is how far, look underneath the cloud shield here, how far into the Pacific North that's going to spread. Because this is going to overrun it. And the risk there is that we're going to be getting the chance for some ice. In fact, let's go to the ice first. So over the next few days, we are going to be watching for the risk of, of significant ice accumulation. This is like Eugene to Portland stretching here along parts of the Columbia River, but right on the border between uh, you know, Oregon and Washington. And this will stretch up toward Seattle as well. So we have to keep an eye out on the ice risk in that region. Other than that, though, we still have more snow to be talking about. So let's broaden this out to a U.S. view and look at the chance at getting two inches in the next three days. So we talked about this yesterday, but there's a bit of a squeeze going on in the atmosphere right here. That's going to give the chance for some snow. We have this system that was in the Mid-South yesterday rolling up the East Coast today. And then as that big low kind of moves its way on shore, that's what's helping to add the snow into this region. Now, I'm be honest with you, quite excited about the snow that's coming into parts of Montana, primarily for the fact that this is one of our drier regions. We need to get this snow into place here. We've got to get some form of moisture. But how much? Well, if we step this up to four inches, that's your probability of getting four inches. And if we step it up to eight, we're going to clear out a lot of areas other than the Great Lakes, downward of the Great Lakes, here coming out of parts of Maine into the Canadian Maritime, and then in our kind of Cascades and Northern Rockies. That's our best chance at getting quite a bit of snow. So thinking about that and just remembering this ice threat is going to be a main story in the Northwest. Let's go and have a look here at the high res NAM. So early this morning, playing through the rest of today. So this is through mid morning and then later that snow is going to move through New England. The lake effect snow is going on behind it. The Arctic air is sitting inside this high pressure cell. 
And as this exits late today throughout the rest of New England, what will be very challenging is predicting exactly where that rain snow line is going to be. And there is the risk of some mixed precipitation, maybe through New Jersey into New York, right in through here. But most of the rest of this will be snow on the back side. Now after that exits, we'll take a look at how much snow we're expecting in a few moments. Our attention is going to go to the northwest, and you can already see that by tonight, as the overrunning takes place, we've got our risk of ice developing here. National Weather Service has warned as to possibly up to three-tenths of an inch of ice. And, I mean, in terms of ice, that, that is a huge, huge number. We care about even a glaze of it. So this is possibly going to be quite a damaging ice storm overall because this is coming with some stronger winds as well. But playing through tonight, getting into Wednesday morning, and Wednesday midday, and then Wednesday evening, you can already see the snows in those same areas we just highlighted. I love seeing this coming through this section of Montana to Wyoming, a place that's been in a bit of a snow deficit. More heavy snows in the Colorado Rockies as well. We'll get out there into early Thursday morning, and there again is this boundary kind of setting up right in this area. It's more that it's just sandwiched between two high-pressure cells. Ah, that was a bad drawing there, sorry. These two high-pressure cells that's just squeezing the air right in the middle, giving us the chance for getting that, uh, that snow to squeeze out of the colder air. So we'll keep an eye on that. But you can already see the shift that's happening late in the week. We're opening up the Gulf, and this is going to be a bigger deal once we get into next week, around the 22nd, 23rd. So that just kind of squeezes us through the next three days here. We're out to the, or two days, we're out to the 18th now. What we need to do is kind of take a look at some bigger picture things as we go forward. So I want to start off with the accumulation maps. I'm just going to show you the 10 to 1 maps from the ECMWF this morning just to kind of get a handle on where we think this heavier snow is going to be. These are five-day maps, so just the next five days. And again, I know you see quite a bit of snow right in through this area, maybe three, four, five inches of snow. But the reality is, is the conversion from the rain initially, possibly a little bit of icing, and then getting this to flip over, this will be the most challenging place. And, you know, what's crazy about what I'm circling here is there's, uh, I don't know, 30 million people inside of what I'm kind of going over here. This is a very challenging forecast. And because I mostly focus on on bigger picture agriculture, I don't have the challenge of forecasting that I-95 quarter. And that's not to say there's not ag in Jersey, you know, right through here or around Philadelphia or right away as soon as you get out of New York City. I'm just kind of making a point that this is a, a challenging forecast for my East Coast colleagues. You can see the lake effect snow still adding up in and around Buffalo, coming off the end of Lake Ontario as well, and the downwind here of Superior, uh, Michigan, and Huron. Uh, then that second system that rolls through, it's got an inch or two in it, maybe. That's what we can expect right into this area. Let's flip this over to the west coast here and get an idea on the five-day snow folks. Got a new model running. Let's go back to the zero Z and flip that out to 120 hours, so a five-day look. So again, we're talking 20 to 30 plus inches in the Cascades because the target is farther to the north. The Sierra not adding as much. But the Northern Rockies really grabbing quite a bit, and the models continue to stay decently aggressive on picking up four, five, six inches of snow in places in Montana, but a pretty wide swath of two to four. So I love it. We need the moisture back in that area. Okay, so I just showed you the European model, but I want you to know that right now our models have kind of jumped back up in their performance after really not being well initialized for a while there uh, with last week's systems. So as we compare the two, let's just kind of get an idea on what they're going to be saying. Now, the bigger picture issue is that for the next five days, we are still kind of watching this Arctic you know, invasion here continuing to develop. It actually comes in two waves, pushes clear into the southeast. But the Pacific jet kind of uh, you know, going more zonal is going to start to flood in some much more mild air, such that by day five through ten, we really start to shift this in a big way. So most of this warmth is coming after this weekend, but as it does, it's gonna be helped along by a big southeast ridge pumping moisture and heat back in the middle part of the country. Now what's gonna be important about that is what it's gonna to do to the precipitation type. So let's do what we normally do and compare the GFS to the European model. And let's just play through what we've already seen with the high res NAM. So again, look at that challenging forecast right here on the rain snow line. That then moves through and the attention goes into the northwest as the low comes in. And we can just rock back and forth in the overnight hours tonight into Wednesday and watch the precipitation mix take place right here in the Willamette Valley. This is uh, getting into midday Wednesday, the snow coming in. You can watch it spread right in those areas that we need to see the moisture getting back into, into place. 
And then you're just going to watch the squeeze right in through the middle here, this coming in Thursday. And there's this weak little trough that's going to sneak out ahead of this, maybe providing some more snow from parts of the Ohio River Valley in toward uh, the Mid-Atlantic. But this isn't a lot of snow. This is the extra little kick on the back side. Okay, so this is Friday. Getting into Saturday, high pressure comes in. So this is your next big dump of really cold air coming in late this week in the midsection of the country. And then after that, it's going to be the placement of that high, which is sitting right over Illinois by you know Saturday night in both models. It's going to be where it goes next. And the models are taking this straight over to the East Coast, over to North Carolina, and allowing it to sit there for a while. So as we talked about yesterday, what this does, high pressure in the southeast takes the winds out of the south, moves them out of the south into the midsection of the country. So this brings with it a lot of warmth. This opens up the gulf. It's a transport mechanism. And as we talked about with the jet stream just continuing to slowly press its way toward the west coast, there's just multiple days of bringing in some rain in the west. Now we could, by early next week, get some of that moisture into Southern California where we desperately need it. But this isn't the, the main kind of, uh, you know, we can. There are some years where the jet stream is just full on targeting California, dumping the rain. So a week from now, watch the Gulf open up, bringing the rain snow line way to the north. And I know the models are not going to be real settled on what's happening out here at this time frame. But I'm just kind of giving you an idea that it's going to shift around and the flow is going to come from a different direction. That would be out of the south. And it's really going to start to get wet. Now, thinking about that, I wanted to take you back where we were yesterday by looking at the snow water equivalent. Now, I'm not worried about this pattern ruining the snow that's in the western mountains. What it is going to change is going to change the snow depth that we've got, you know, in parts of the Mid-South now and the snow that came from these three systems that rolled through here delivering heavy snow, plus the snow that's still yet to come on this colder air. So we can look at the change by using a model parameter called snow depth. So this is basically the forecast model's attempt at uh, seeing how the snow depth could possibly change. And I'm going to use the European Ensemble to give us an idea on this. So this is not a forecast of accumulating snow, it's the change on the surface. And I'm going to have to play this relatively quickly here, but as you go forward, this is through the weekend, getting out into early next week, you start to see the snow beginning to melt away, right? So you, you see this indication that we're going to be bringing such mild air here that we're going to go from quite deep snow to not so deep snow as we put rain in on top of it. Now, the jet stream, of course, in the Pacific and Atlantic, as we talked about, is the culprit. So as it starts to just really get screaming in this direction, we're going to watch the tail end of this long jet extension start to peel its way back toward Japan. Ready? So this is by Sunday, as I just continue to play out there to Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Sorry, this is a bit choppy. My uh, internet hotel here, or my hotel at the internet is not super fast. But there you go. This is out by the 27th. The jet begins to retract. The flow comes out of the southwest again and then just rolls across the open Atlantic Ocean. So the net effect of all of this is to give us a week two pattern that just starts to open up the gulf, producing quite a bit of rain here. I think that the CPC, when they update their graphic later today, might go a little bit drier for the West Coast, as we see in both the uh, GFS and the European. But this is now going to bring in a very wet system. Uh, and what I mean by that is not a lot of snow with this next system that starts around the 22nd and 23rd of the month. So much more mild regime overall. Now, when does it get cold again? We still have to ask that question. And I'll just kind of make a point here of what's been, what's been problematic this year. Now, when you first look at this, this is kind of like the atmosphere's version of tie-dye. But my point is to show you zonal winds. They've been fastest here, and they've been fastest there. That's, that's pretty normal for an El Nino year. We've had more meridional or north-south flow in this section of, of the United States and Canada. So my point is that if we wanted to get and sustain cold air in place, we've got to get the, the, the zonal flow coming much farther into the, you know, into this region so that it can dive into the United States. And we just haven't had that. It's been a very kind of El Nino-like winter overall because of the speed of the subtropical jet, which has been here, and no polar jet constantly invading the United States. So we do have cold air now, of course. Okay, That was complements of the dislodging of the very, very cold air that was over Greenland and Alaska at the end of December. That's when it dislodged. And we are frost, looking at our frost thread. It does get down into this part of, of Florida here um, you know, in the next few days. 
But uh, if I showed you those max temperatures, this is today's max temperature, getting into tomorrow. And again, the color shading represents difference from normal. Here comes the second wave of cold air on Thursday into Friday. So that's the second of the two I mentioned this week. And then as we get into the weekend, watch the moderation as it go from Saturday into Sunday, Sunday into Monday. I mean, for many people that just endured what we are enduring right now, this is going to feel like shorts and t-shirt weather. I mean, very mild air trying to work its way back in. We will likely see the forecast model's error on the on the side of being too warm right in through here as of Monday just because of the snowpack that is in place. But it's a, the point here being that we will be getting more mild air back into North America. So this is day five through 10. The European model looks very, very similar. The coldest air goes to Alaska and Greenland. And then day 10 through 15, we started to see very mild air because of the behavior of the North Atlantic jet and the North Pacific jet being in the wrong configuration to deliver a lot of cold air. So do we have more chances for colder? Yeah, we do. I mean, February is still ahead of us. And that for some places can be a source of, you know, a time period over which we can get massive swings in temperatures. But as it stands, the polar vortex is currently kind of disrupted and split. We have one piece here, one piece here, and the big kind of pulse that big big ridge event that pushed up over Alaska now over the Chukchi Sea, northern parts of Siberia is in place as well. But the polar vortex strength is increasing, and that increase in strength represents a um, you know a, um, the stronger the polar vortex, the lower the probability of massive Arctic air. That's the way to think about it. So it was way down here; it's now increased back up toward average, and uh, therefore it's a, I don't want to say it's a non-player, but it's a non-player for the cold. I'd say in the next couple of weeks. So what's the most dominant teleconnection? It just remains to be the MJO. And the MJO is moving into these phases, which we generally consider our warmer phases in winter. Phase three, four, five, and six. Seven, eight, one, two, these are our colder phases in winter. So we just kind of think, be on this side, warmer for North America, this side cooler. And sometimes there's a lag. Sometimes it takes five to 10 days for the effect to get there. But I kind of want to show you maybe what could happen if the MJO stays at such high amplitude and sweeps around. Let's just say it takes 15 days to get to phase seven and then we start February in phase eight and one. This could be what we could get ready. Right now it makes a ton of sense. You see this and that? That's what's forcing the jet stream to just scream across the Pacific, or excuse me, the Atlantic, it's just rolling out in that area. Overall, the pressure patterns in MJO phase five we're in right now are kind of bland across a lot of North America. No, no strong anomalies. It's the North Atlantic, which is why we started with that today. That kind of takes the cake. So that's part of the transition. If we get into phase six, we tend to build ridges right in this area, which continue to help the West pull in uh, uh, mild air. And it also just helps the jet stream stay kind of here to the North and race across the North Atlantic. So again, you look at this and it's not overall a, 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 um, an active pattern and you just tend to get flow over this ridge that dives into this area, bringing in drier air, no great setup for, for major winter storms. But we do expect to get into phase seven and phase seven is kind of the, the reload. Look, ridges build back in here. Deep troughs start to take place between the Aleutian Islands and Hawaii. And this is just the beginning of setting us up with flow that comes out of the Southwest again. So if we sweep around to phase eight, ah, this is where the party starts again. Now look, we've kind of flipped the pattern here, right? See, there's a ridge north and a trough south, and that helps reinforce the negative phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation and cold air coming in and the setup for a much more stormy pattern. And if you would like to go back into a February that's just cranking on winter weather, then you want it to sweep all the way around to phase one. And in that case, just bring it on. This is everything we want in terms of winter storms, southwest flow, deep troughs over the four corner states or into, you know, all the way down to Southern California and just ripping off storm system after storm system. So I guess what I would tell you is if the MGO progression is right, February is going to go back over to another active time period. When? It's kind of hard to say. It may not be until, you know, the end of the first week of February, maybe a bit longer. But I think February's got a punch left in it that we need to keep an eye on across the lower 48. That's it. Okay. From here, I want to give you some kind of perspective on the models. With El Nino still in the background, I look out there at the GFS extended forecast. And it just says the next 30 days looks like this in terms of precip. And you can't really make an argument against it. And it also has support from the European model. So that's from the 19th of 
of uh, January to the 19th of February. Now, this will be critical. Do we actually build this much additional precipitation into the West in this pattern? That's what I'm going to watch because the West needs this. We need snow in the mountains in the West to get back up close to 100% on our snow water equivalent for this time of year. And as much as we've had recently in terms of precipitation, anything we can additionally get during winter in this area, especially if it goes over a bit mild for a few weeks, um, I mean, mild is relative, it's winter, but that pumps, that puts moisture back into the system. So let's just watch it very carefully. Quick transition to South America. I'm going to show you these graphics. This is looking at um, soybean harvest. I am not an expert in, in this, but it appears right now that the harvest paste for the early planted crop is above, sta uh, above stage. What I'll be watching is, not above stage, excuse me, above pace. What I'll be watching is how do things progress right here at the end of January and beginning of February. This is the uh, corn planting progress, which is behind the five-year average, okay? Now, the story we've been kind of painting for the last few weeks seems to be playing out in the near-term forecasts. We've gone back over dry north, wetter in southern Brazil, Uruguay, parts of Paraguay, and central parts of Argentina. But this is week one as we make the transition into week two, which approaches the end of the month. The MJO's more favorable position dries out Argentina, which no one's going to complain down here about this, but starts to bring in much wetter conditions across those areas that at the end of January, beginning of February, need to be making a lot of progress with harvest uh, and planting of safrina crops. So let's watch that carefully. That narrative hasn't changed, and I think we'll just kind of wrap this video up here. I appreciate your attention, and we'll talk again tomorrow. Thanks.